Welcome to the Market Pulse podcast from Equifax, where we break down the latest economic and credit insights to help you navigate today's business landscape. Welcome to the Market Pulse podcast, continuing today with our series on the economic and credit environment and their impact on consumer stress. I'm your host, Marie Urtube, member of the Equifax Risk Advisors team. This group identifies economic considerations and leverages data and analytics to translate into industry insights and recommendations. Ultimately, to support our clients navigate economic uncertainty while uncovering hidden opportunities in consumer credit risk. I'm pleased to welcome back our panel of experts in the Risk Advisors Group, Dave Soika, Jesse Harden, Tom O'Neill, and our practice leader, Thomas Aliff. Welcome, gentlemen. Good to have you. This is the third podcast in the Consumer Stress Series. During the last one, we focused on the different types of data used to distinguish consumer stress, the segments of the population that are thriving versus those that are struggling, and all the segments in between. We also explored what lenders could do when they have access to these kind of insights. Today, we will be focusing on the 2023 economic landscape, the impact on holiday and retail spending, and the tie between consumer stress and sales. Before we begin our discussion, though, David Fieldhouse, Director of Consumer Credit Analytics at Moody's Analytics, will share a quick economic update. David? The U.S. economy is powering on. Last week, we got the second estimate of third quarter GDP, and it showed an annualized increase of 5.2%. Gross domestic income, which is an alternative view of economic growth, came in actually at a more subdued rate, though, around 1.5% increase in the third quarter. If you average the two together, that's 3.3%. This is a very healthy growth rate for the economy, but it's going to be unsustainable given the high interest rates and low savings rate that we're seeing. We're already actually seeing some of the pressure on economic growth showing up in the fourth quarter. We have a high frequency GDP model, and that growth rate right now is coming around 1.6%, which is still healthy, far away from a recession, but it's obviously a material deceleration from the prior quarter's growth rate. Despite this robust growth rate, interest rates are going to take its toll, and our baseline forecast forecast expects growth to slow through 2024, with real GDP gains decelerating and the unemployment rate rising from 3.9% to 4.1% by early 2025. That said, uh, a recession is is still unlikely and it's not something that we're forecasting. We do have some risks that we're watching. We are concerned about the interest rate volatility that could derail growth at any point. Long-term rates still have been volatile in recent weeks, and this gives any would-be borrowers pause. We also have to be concerned about any misstep from the Federal Reserve, which could easily tip the U.S. into recession. And and while we're not assuming any more additional rate hikes, uh, inflation has been sticky. You know, any global developments could increase energy prices. And if some scenario like that unfolded, it's very easy to see the central bank overreacting and increasing short-term rates, which would increase the odds of any kind of economic contraction or recession. So you know, these are the risks that we're watching out for. Thank you, David. As we continue to navigate through the holiday season, we hear some surprising statistics in the share of retail purchases between brick and mortar versus online stores. 94% of shopping is still conducted in person versus only 16% through e-commerce. It's at 21% worldwide. Moreover, 56% of shoppers visit a store before making a purchase online based on Nerd Wallet. Although it is expected for this trend to re- reverse to 95% digital uh, by 2040, that is 17 years out. Weren't we there already? Online shopping accounted for a little over 5% of all retail purchases in 2007. So although the current participation might seem surprisingly low, it has tripled. And while over 80% of U.S. shoppers prefer to shop in person or rely on a combination of online and in-store retailers, 88% of Gen Zers, 67% of Millennials, and 56% of Gen Xers 
opt for online shopping based on research by big commerce with always open and time savings as the main reasons. Jesse, what are some of the economic uncertainties impacting the consumer shopping experience in general and the transition from physical to online stores? So it seems like there's a lot. We uh, we had a great inflation read in November, as you just heard from David Fieldhouse. And so the headline inflation numbers continue to fall. Obviously, that's good. But really, when you when you question what the benefit is to the consumer, you know, does does a 3.7% headline inflation versus 3.2%, does that really uh, you know, change a consumer's habits or perceptions or spending behaviors? And my hunch is that consumers probably still like feel like prices are a little high. And at least, you know, I, I feel like that, at least when I go to the grocery store, probably others do as well. We got a, a interesting uh, notice this morning from Apple that my son's uh, Apple Arcade was going up $2. And $2 isn't that big of a deal. But certainly, when you start to see how inflation takes hold and every consumer transaction goes up by some small amount, you can see where consumer sentiment then becomes impacted based on inflation. So, you know, questioning the maybe the academic nature of how inflation moves up or down with, you know, the, the fact that the consumer really does feel the, you know, the pain as, as these prices continue to go up. I think we're also seeing, you know, health in the job market. Certainly, I think the, the job growth being at 150,000 jobs in October, that's uh, below the, the 12 month trend, uh, moving average trend of 250,000 jobs, but it's still a, uh, a solid number. So I think when we see the the wages and consumers, you know, they're still employed, they have, uh, you know, good income coming in. I think that's going to help the the trend, at least of consumers feeling like they can they can go out and spend. Certainly, we want to continue to watch some of the you know larger workforce reductions that we've heard about. City uh, Schwab, some of those are. Uh, more recent discussions. And then to a lesser extent, I'd say let's, you know, let's think of the things that we've been talking about all year, things like student loan payment moratorium ramping up that on, the on ramp process is going to help consumers when they, um, you know, when they have to start making those payments again, uh, for student loans, but certainly the the fact that the uh, student loan you know bills are coming due it's just it it adds pressure to the consumer the same when we look at balances that have have uh, have increased with revolving debt so I think all of those are are areas that we need to take into consideration when we think about you know how consumers are interested in potentially opening up their wallet this season. And then, so I think all in, I would say that the consumer is still strong, especially from a macroeconomic standpoint. The uh, the notion then, though, that the K shaped economy, and we've talked all we've all talked about that before. You know, it still holds true. There are some groups that are having good success in this economy. There are others that are challenged. So I think figuring out how to understand the implications to those two is going to be uh, really prevalent when we look at the shopping season and then moving forward into 2024. Thank you for setting the stage for us, Jesse. We are, we are hearing of a slowdown in spending over the last months of the year. And in fact, the National Retail Federation has said it expects holiday sales to increase 3 to 4% compared to last year to 957 to 967 billion, the lowest holiday growth since 2018 based on the New York Times. There is a slowdown in spending from higher financial stress due to the higher cost of living and consumers feel squeezed based on the household pulse survey from the U.S. Census Bureau shared by Moody's Analytics last week. The oldest and youngest age groups are the least worried, carrying the lowest balances as well, while the 30 to 39 and the 40 to 49 year age groups carry the highest balance and debt to income. Um, so their concern is justified. Tom. During the October Market Pulse webinar, the planning for the holiday shopping season with segmented consumer data, you addressed some of the nuances uh, Jesse referred to just now on the consumer uh, sec in the consumer segments, considering characteristics such as age, income, family size, and uh, Mike Spriggs from Fiserv uh, shared insights from consumer spending as well. What, what are some of the highlights of the holiday spending outlook that were discussed and how were these different uh, this year compared to 2022? 
there was optimism initially going into the holiday season. And, and you heard Mike talk about that on, on the October Market Pulse. The feeling that, that 2023 was going to outpace 2022. And I think that's still out there. You know, that certainly can happen. Uh, but I think just how strongly consumers are going to show up and and just as importantly, where they're going to show up is still you know, very much to be determined. As you mentioned, we did see a, a cutback on spending in October. That that did follow uh, six months. You know, it was a very strong summer in terms of consumer spending. Uh, Q3 of 2023 was uh, you know, particularly strong when it came to that. And even that that October downturn, so to speak, was you know when you adjust that for falling prices of of gasoline and other things, it wasn't as bad as as uh, most economists thought. There is room for optimism there, um, but but this is again you know what we've been harping on for the last couple months. This is all happening when there's there's some pretty strong headwinds you know blowing in our faces, Jesse. You know brought up some examples of how inflation has been an impact and it's not the the huge headline things you know the numbers that we see it's it's you know the things that hit the consumers are those you know thousand and one small increases on things that they're buying every day the the foods you know the the subscriptions you know the rent in many cases you know gas obviously uh, so it's it's all of these things that add up um, and we've had a tendency of say of of talking about inflation with the good news that's been coming out yeah you know, as if you know it was you know, a dead issue but it's not it's still there um, and certainly the the impact that it's had yeah you know, up to now is is still being felt and then of course there's there's all the other things that the other headwinds you know we know of the the increased you know, use of debt you know consumer revolving debt is at an all-time high we've heard the one trillion dollar card debt that that we've recently surpassed uh, delinquencies have been on the rise since 2021 and it in many cases are back up to pre-pandemic levels or in some cases in some sectors they're even past you know, pre-pandemic levels uh, at this point and and importantly savings uh, has has dwindled. Yeah, you know, we we saw how a lot of savings were built up, a lot of dry powder that that economists speak of uh, was was built up in the early stages of the pandemic, and in many parts of the population, that's gone. Yeah, some some of them still retain a good a fair amount, and and you know, as we've been talking about with the K shaped and and the diverse uh, impacts to to different populations, there are some populations that are coming out of the pandemic very strong and, and are in good shape. But we know also that there's many households that are strapped and, and their savings are used up. And, and it's not a small number of households at this point. So there there are things that that do need to be worked through. And we hear from a lot of major retailers that yeah, they're taking that consumer stress into account. A lot of them are focusing on value shopping and and acknowledging that times are tight for uh, for consumers in their marketing and, and pricing strategies. And one last thing I would say before, yeah, as we're going into uh, this this holiday season, is that the one thing that does seem certain is that credit usage is going to continue to increase. Uh, about you know over a third of the the consumers out there say in surveys that using more credit is their way of dealing with the additional uh, consumption that they intend to do over the holiday season. So for all the talk that we've had lately about increased you know, use of revolving debt, I think that's a pattern that we're only going to see increase. Yeah, and, and there's more. There's also a third of consumers based on a study uh, by Credit Card Tracker that is likely to apply for a store card during the holiday season. So that pairs uh, with what, what you've been commenting on. Uh, based on payments uh, payments report, card spending has become the top payment choice for 36% of consumers. In the paycheck-to-paycheck economy for more than 60% of individuals, an average 21% utilization rate, which, as we've discussed during Market Pulse, varies from 15 to 50% for some consumers, with a 20 Two percent average interest rate. That is expensive debt to carry, particularly if you're making minimum or partial payments. Your options for holiday shopping are limited, and those uh, making full payment balances, known as transactors, can enjoy the shopping experience and manage financial stress. But they make up less than half of consumers this year. Dave, 
that gets me to you. What, what does this scenario translate into and what financial options, options do consumers really have? Yeah, thanks, Maria. I just want to uh, circle back uh, to a point Jesse made. Uh, I think I read an article the other day where consumers, and this goes back to the, the prices are, are too high. And, you know, consumers are saying to, you know, goods and service providers, you know, we carried you through the pandemic. We put up with the higher prices and so on. They got to come back down. And so that'll be interesting to see if we get any any reduction in prices as we go forward, as the economy improves. Uh, so that's kind of one thing to kind of keep in mind uh, to be on the lookout for. Um, but, you know, so why why am I here? Does that really talk about, again, what, what consumers are going to use uh, this holiday season? And uh, a recent study uh, uh, that I found on payments.com said that 32% of uh, shoppers expect to use one or more credit options, um, which is actually down from 37%. And I'll get into that alternative piece uh, shortly. But, um, another surprising piece was, again, consumer usage of, uh, of credit for holiday spending is expected to be about 13%, which is actually down from 15%. You know, we've seen October sa retail sales uh, saw the first decline. In over seven months, um, again putting pressure on the uh, the brick and mortar retail outlets. Uh, we've been showing that those uh, declining balances and originations in our Market Pulse uh, webinars from the retail credit perspective. And so again, obviously consumers have a couple different choices: private label, their current bank card, but also a you know I'll say an up and comer in the U.S. But what's been around for quite some time internationally is the BNPL option, right? And as the economic pain of high interest rates and high inflation were driving consumers to explore other alternatives, enter BNPL. It's uh, you know again an unexpected financial haven for consumers in the U.S., the U.K. as well as Australia. Uh, BNPL is evolving from a mere payment alternative to becoming a crucial and practical solution for helping uh, manage personal finances. I know Maria, you touched on some of the uh, you know credit usage by uh, by age groups, and um, BNPL uh, is also reflective of that. We have seen uh, consumers kind of across the board that it's not just for the young. A portrait of uh, BNPL uh, user base is typically dominated by consumers, but again, I mean, half of those are between twenty five and forty four, um, and they've used uh, BNPL at least once um, over over the uh, the last year or so. The the payment uh, method is uh, very popular across different income brands. And it's, again, kind of a trend that highlights the broad appeal. BNPL has always been kind of positioned as for the underserved or the or the credit or the, the credit uh, unworthy, if you will, or cash strapped. And um, if we think about it, again, BNPL is very similar to private label in terms of the, the financing mechanism. And so, you know, savvy shoppers with with the money, with the credit scores, that want to you know have a you know a six week uh, no interest set of payments, uh, very similar to a, a a six month you know same as cash or a twelve month no no back in the the uh, pri my private label days with furniture and so on, but really it's it's not it really is becoming a a, a not just a, a discretionary spending tool but a vital budget management resource. Twenty seven percent of American BNPO users uh, employ these loans to tide them over to their next paycheck. 21% of them use them for essential groceries, you know, a strategy for fiscal survival rather than that luxury spend, you know, like financing the Peloton and so on. Really, again, it's that 0% interest that's really hooked the U.S. shopper. We'll, we'll see how that changes. Um, and one of the challenges that BNPL uh, providers have been experiencing is, um, again, a tightening of the marketplace. Again, they, they, they flourished when interest rates were low and, and funding for them was cheap. As rates have risen, their funding's been kind of cut back, and their venture capitalists are, are requiring higher returns. And so now they're extending those terms. So it's not really just a six month option. It might be a six month option, it might be a 12 month option, it could be a three year option. And they're also starting to charge interest rates. So we'll see how that uh, trend continues. But, um, you know, as an overall alternative or, or an augmentation to holiday shopping, BNPL, I think, is here to stay. Thank you, Dave, and and thank you for providing some of that perspective as well, right? Beyond the the U.S. and and Thomas, now I turn um, to you. Uh, we've been discussing the U.S. economic and credit environment and consumer. What does the international economic outlook look like in comparison, and what can be expected uh, during the final months of 2023? 
Thanks, Maria. It is really important to understand, uh, you know, in comparison and contrast to what's happening in the U.S. as it uh, is occurring from an international level. A lot of the same trends that we're observing in the U.S. do happen elsewhere, but they're happening at different rates. For example, a lot of the things that we're hearing from an international perspective are related to the inflationary pressures. And I know from your home country, I know I'm probably not the one to speak about this, but every time I see, you know, things that are occurring there um, uh, from an inflation as well as interest rates standpoint, I think it's a typo. Uh, you know, for example, the you know the interest rates were 97% in June, and now they're 133%. We've seen inflation there 138%. So it's just massive amounts of inflation that's you know uh, impacting consumers in, uh, in one way or another. Then as you move across the globe, inflationary pressures, you know, the UK, you know, uh, dropped to 6.4%. So many of these places are higher than what we're observing in the US. Um, and then, you know, moving down into Australia and New Zealand, again, it's, you know, above 6% for some time. Uh, in, in those places where, you know, uh, somewhere like Spain, for example, is about 3% in Q1 and, and it has starting to trend, uh, you know, downward in, in some ways. And, and then when we uh, consider other aspects is how are those being addressed via interest rates? And the interest rates, of course, uh, impacting, uh, you know, consumers as well, because then it, it, uh, it, creates a higher cost to the consumer to be able to uh, take out various levels of debt. And so the, a lot of that, though, when we think about demand, demand is still on the rise in many, uh, in many locations. We've talked about bank card demand being high, and that's really the, the main asset class in the U.S. that's, uh, that's still up. But if we look across the globe, we're seeing that uh, you know, continue to occur and grow both uh, you know, for card and personal loan um, in, in many cases. Like, for example, if we look at the you know, U.K. and Spain, you know, credit demand has now reach pre-pandemic levels in UK and compared to 2019, although it's not necessarily the same with uh, you know situation in uh, in Spain at hovering around 90 percent. And then as you move down into you know places like Australia and New Zealand, you know the credit card demand in New Zealand really remains strong for the second quarter of 2023, with average weekly volume up seven percent against 2022 levels. Mortgage demand uh, you know stabilizing uh, for the quarter at negative 1.7 percent compared to 2022. So there, there's various you know, degrees in which both the inflation as well as you know demand for credit and you know consumer needs are driving you know various you know levels of uh, of cost up. Thank you, Tom, for that perspective. Economic stress may force shoppers to reprioritize spending this year in the U.S., cutting back on discretionary spending, shifting to uh, from higher uh, ticket items and luxury purchases to more essential, focused, and experiential even uh, spends instead. Federal student loans, as, as Tom referred to, will be in the mix and for some households, with some becoming more strategic in the use of their credit and others looking for promotions, discounts, and budget-friendly options. Affordability, consumer sentiment, and confidence at the center of it all. I would like to thank Jesse, Tom, Dave, and Thomas for joining me today. To our listeners, I hope you enjoyed today's topics. If you have questions or suggestions for future podcasts, please reach out to us at riskadvisors at equifax.com. We look forward to hearing from you and happy holidays. The information and opinions provided in this podcast are intended as general guidance only and are subject to change without notice. The views presented during the podcast are those of the presenter as of the date this podcast was recorded and do not necessarily reflect official positions of Equifax. Investor analysts should direct inquiries using the contact us box on the investor relations section at Equifax.com.